Okay. Uh, welcome to session six. Today we're going to talk about infusion and syringe pumps. Um, for those of you who are new to Project ECHO and the format, I want to give you a few um, ground rules just so we know what's going on today. Um, the foundation of our conversation is love and respect. Please respond kindly rather than react if you disagree. Um, go ahead and test your equipment ahead of time when you can. You can be sure to mute your microphone in the bottom left. We've disabled unmuting for now, um, but we'll enable that feature when we get to discussion. Um, when you unmute yourself in the bottom left, please introduce yourself as well before speaking, um, who you are and where you're from. Speak clearly, and if you're in a large room, stay close to your microphone. Um, and if you have any issues at all throughout the um, conversation, you can go ahead and email us at that email below, or you can chat us in the bar, and you can find that either at the bottom of your screen or off to the right. Today we're going to hear from Guna. Um, We'll start with a didactic about infusion and syringe pumps, then we'll take that poll and we'll know which case study to focus on, and then we'll open things up for discussion and asking questions at the very end. I want to summarize our very first session on PPE and disinfection because it's so critical to everything that biomeds do. Um, what is so dangerous about COVID-19 is that it can stay um, stable on surfaces for a very long time particularly on plastic and stainless steel for up to three days. As you know, that is what most hospital surfaces are made of, um, so that's something to keep in mind. So how do we keep our hospitals and our engineers and our clinicians safe? Um, what we do is we use PPE first, things like gloves, um, single-use gowns, caps, shoe covers. Um, and on the left, you can see that list. And please remember that PPEs do not replace hand hygiene. That's also very important. Um, and as far as high level disinfectants that you can use on your environment or on your equipment, you can see a list to the right of what WHO recommends. So in summary, everybody everywhere should be practicing basic hygiene, social distancing, but if you're in a hospital setting, you should also increase the frequency of things like basic hygiene, um, use of PPE and disinfection. Again, the virus can last for up to three days on some surfaces, so please be careful. We want to show you a few resources. Now, these don't have necessarily anything to do directly with infusion or syringe pumps, um, but the first one is a list of specifications for equipment that WHO recommends for COVID response. Um, if you need supplies, if you need equipment, this is a really good way to make sure you're buying the right things. Um, and if you need help on ventilators, this is a resource we found recently called the Ventilator Training Alliance. Um, you can see a screenshot of their homepage on the right. Basically, it goes through all of the different um, distributors, the different brands, the different models, um, and it gives you really good guides for things like um, corrective maintenance, preventive maintenance, and it's a good resource to have. Our objective today is to use this refresher module to sort of enhance your skills, remind you of some things. We'll talk about a little bit of background, things like main parts, their function of infusion and syringe pumps. We'll also talk about preventive maintenance and then basic troubleshooting. And with that, I think it's time for me to hand it over to Guna to actually give us some information about infusion and syringe. Hi. So we're going to talk about infusion device. So there's two classification of uh, infusion device that you normally going to see: gravity control infusion, infusion type, then infusion pump itself. When you talk about infusion pump, you're going to see shrink pump, volumetric, all this. When you talk about gravity, is normal normal method of it. So you're going to uh, normally use in most of the wards all that without any control that's for gravity control so this like infusion pump you're talking about active mode with the pressure occlusion all this is controlling by uh, rate flow delivering small quantity of uh, uh, flow and uh, you can deliver eye flow as well. 
So they got an alarm, alarm sensor, pressure sensor to monitor the flow. That's on infusion. Gravity is most, most of the time that you're going to see. It's a whole way of doing. Type of infusion, you're going to see shrink pump, shrink with the line and PCA pumps with the switch control and volumetric pump. They got a reservoir bag, sensor, sensor for drop, monitoring drops, uh, um, reservoir drop infusion sensor and drip chamber and volumetric pump and the uh, infusion line itself. PCA pump is one of the common thing used for delivery drug, drugs for on the safe, safety limit. So it used on the relief post operation included agglycine, similar with shrink pump, but uh, required free flow, flow method actually. Working principle. So working principle, we're going to talk about peristaltic mechanism, linear and rotary, and string mechanism operation, all this. Peristaltic mechanism, there's two types. One is linear peristaltic mechanism, and another one is rot rotary peristaltic mechanism. So when you talk about linear, you got a fluid going in with the finger that going to move the fluid out to the line. And a rotary prestaltic uh, mechanism is something uh, pushing the fluid through the roller and roto and line out. That's how it works. More detail on linear peristaltic mechanism. Majority of volume infusion pump have drop sensor, all this, occlusion pressure, and air sensor in the line to monitor the fluid movement to work in the mechanism itself. So anything goes wrong, this particular sensor will indicate all the issues like pressure or occlusion, anything. Most common type used in infusion, volumetric infusion device. This is one of the most commonly used actually. So the, the finger will press the silicon. You can see on the top, the graphic, by di different angle of uh, ro rotation, the fingers will move and move the fluid in the tubing to other direction out. That's how it works. Rotary prestaltic mechanism is very commonly used uh, in the certain uh, fusion pump. These are like uh, movement of a uh, rotary that will pull the fluid in from the tubing line and out again. You can see the, uh, the movement of the fluid coming in and going out. Again. Shrink mechanism is using an analyst screw that adjusts automatically to the shrink coupled to the instrument. You can see the uh, the endless screw with the move, movement line that moving the string and forcing the pressure to create the flow. So it can be used individually or multi-channel system. Um, 
uh, one of the thing that you can do is you can use a multiple channel more than one string pump some cases you're going to use more than five so it's that's how the system works so another photos of string pump parts you can see the gearbox the motor is normally the stepper motor and you can see the a lead screw and the nut and the guide line and carriage and the plunger and string to the patient so what happens is this screw when the motor move is going to move the carriage and the guide going to support the carriage uh, to move in the straight line in the proper way it doesn't move the plunger and the shrink will when the uh, plunger start to move you're going to get some output of fluid going to the patient with certain pressure and uh, flow that's how it works operation normally you're going to connect uh, infusion device or shrimp pump to the power power line and you're going to on and check the, and uh, if you're using a shrink device uh, shrink pump device according you need to choose the shrink according to manufacturer specification and fill with the requirement iv fluid and total volume plus the priming volume and remove the air bubble from the shrink and attach the string into the barrel to groove and lock the shrink barrel clamp and snug and sh and set the shrink size accordingly infusion setting once you do the setting you have to set the key and infusion rate that you're going to set uh, a lot minimum 0 0.1 but that's a minimum then press prime to get the fluid to the end of the canola line to make sure you get it a right uh, fluid on the canola line then after that after priming do the clearance all that connect the patient into the iv set with the patient vein line and start to infuse to the patient that's how it works so normally this particular operation you can look into the serviceman uh, user manual of the infusion or shrink pump uh, manual itself you can get more details but these are normally what you do in the operation so when you talk about volume metric pump this is the block diagram infusion line is basically where it go to the patient and you got drop sensor infusion mechanism drawing force all this and display control this is the actual block diagram but we're going to show you the breakdown of the block diagram shortly so this a part of a display and control circuit and alarm when you talk about alarm everyone knows most of the medical device not most all the medical device they got all the alarms that indicate all the issues all that for volumetric you're going to see an alarm that uh, indicate for air bubble occlusion free flow end of infusion low battery and other other indication as well so that's a function of alarm control circuit every device got control circuit and uh, for volumetric you're going to have all these control circuit that monitoring all the calculation dosage and monitoring the alarm everything these are the control the heart of the device itself display and control panel is going to show you all the display information all the details on the lcd screen that's how it works the so this is where you can see all the details of the drops uh, and the flow everything and all the settings you can view 
from the display. Keyboard, I used to setting all the data, all the reference, and all the flows, detail, everything for the device. Infusion mechanism is one of the most important component uh, for roto or shrink, all this that work respond for the fluid flow. So it can be prestaltic or roto type uh, the pump. So it manage your fluid flow, all that. This is where the infusion mechanism play a key role. And the motor driver is generally, they use stepper motor, uh, used to activate the infusion mechanism base. Uh, it activate the movement of the mechanism itself. Drop sensor, I use in prestaltic uh, type and rotor pump. So drop sensor is to monitor the infu infusion line, fluid drop on the into the system, and uh, it calculate how many drop in liters, milliliters are been used. So all the information will send to the control board. Air sensor, prestaltic or roto, indicate of the air system in the in the line. This is important because you don't want air in, inside the infusion line. Occlusion pressure and sensor is monitoring the occlusion pressure on the line of the patient. So if any pressure change is going to indicate and going to give alarm. An infusion line and accessories is normally is a single use and dispose. You have, once you are used, you have to dispose that particular accessories. So you can see air sensor indicate the air system. So infusion line accessories and drip sensor. So drip sensor is normally can be to monitor the drip into the line. And infusion line necessaries is disposable, single use. So this one is detail for shrink pump block diagram. So you can see LCD display, all that. We will go in detail each of this particular block diagram. So when you talk about a detector circuit, you're talking about string sensor, occlusion sensor, empty sensor, near empty, then plunges sensor, clutch detector, low power detector, all that. So we come back to this particular line. A block diagram that send the signal to the control board. So the string plunger move along the driver shaft and motor. When there's an occlusion or obstruction of movement, occlusion sensor will indicate certain uh, pressure and will give you uh, information to the control board. So all the movement of the mechanism are being monitored. Any change of the pressure on the line will be monitored. These are the key sensors that monitoring all this and uh, it's a patient safety function actually. On the other end, you can see the alarm and the string uh, movement all that so on the alarm part of it a string plunger and clamp clamp operate on the on the system that will indicate the control so the plunger sensor have a micro switch 
if the string clamp and sensor is on, the information will send to the CPU. If the instrument external power, internal power control recognize some different of old, uh, requirement voltage and current, it will send the information to the CPU as well. So all these are the key part of it. So when you talk about control board, the control board is this basic thing that every electronic uh, medical device you're going to see. The control board monitor every single uh, changes of a uh, signal or any sensor is going to send information to the control board. Even the mechanism are controlled by the control board. For motor control, it detects the rotation and actual speed according to the program set. So the motor itself run on the electronic circuit because it's using a stepper motor. Stepper motor, they got four step, step signal, depends on the type of stepper motor they're going to use. So it's going to send the information to the CPU, all that. When you set a rate, all that, the stepper motor going to follow according to the rate and uh, at the same time, we'll maintain the speed, all that. You see the motor circuit? So they used a stepper motor, DC type, that step of signal, and uh, it'll move that particular line and uh, monitor all the movement with the motor is attached with the mechanism and uh, it moves accordingly. So you can set uh, for shrink pump, normally the, the shrink are about 60 ml or below. So you, when you set 50 ml, the information is sent and the particular motor going to follow according to the rate and movement and the velocity, all that. So you can monitor the particular information, how many milliliter been delivered, all that, on the display. Power supply and battery operation are very important. The power supply is going to charge the battery and going to send uh, supply to the circuit, all that. And, uh, Battery play a very important role because infusion device uh, or string pump, you need to have a backup battery. If anything goes wrong with your power supply, the backup battery is going to work and uh, keep on running the infusion or the string pump. So the voltage normally going to use five volt and 12 volt, depends on the manufacturer. Some they're going to use a step down transformer. Some are uh, they're going to use switching power supply. So it depends on the design. So this is application uh, used for infusion pump. On the uh, block diagram, LCD display and keypad is uh, normally where you uh, monitor all the information and the keypad to key in all the information that you want to want to set, like uh, the string size and the flow, what's the rate of the flow you want to uh, run, all that are key in here, and you get, get the display information as well. And the display is going to show you whether the lock, the string is locked properly or the string is following according to the recommendation of the manufacturer, all that. So it's going to show on the display. So on application, uh, infusion pump used to admit, administrate IV fluid and shrink is 
uh, so many type of it, regional anesthesia, anti-radium medicine, chemotherapy agent, diabetic, and uh, so on. So these are purpose of, of infusion device. Common problem on the infusion, faulty on the drip sensor, battery fail is very common thing that you're going to see or improper charging. Uh, damage palm housing because drop, clinical user error, very common. Weakening the palm housing. So do not use alcohol base, uh, pure alcohol base to clean the solution on the plastic because the, the particular housing will be like, uh, uh, easily can break and change color. At the same time, most of the uh, this device are waterproof type a bit, so you're going to uh, destroy that particular function actually. Like shrimp palm, you got slipping and uh, plunger may break the glass ring, one of it, damage the palm housing because drop dropped by the clinical user. Battery is one of the common also and in, improper charging and uh, same issue with the material that they use or the chemical they use to clean can cause the housing is not uh, going to be uh, protected very well all that and another common problem on shrink by myself using incorrect shrink size can cause uh, incorrect volume rate, all that, and uh, setting up wrongly, all that. So how to avoid clinical user error? When you use a shrink pump, only use the ma manufactured recommended string. Very important. Pay attention, whatever manufacturer give, on accuracy terms and uh, mechanical accuracy of the pump rather than volume accuracy. Remove the clamp of the infusion set from the mechanism, mechanism side before you attempt to clean the blockage when occlusion occur. So you have to remove it before you do it and make sure clinical user know to avoid using a pump on the patient when alarm are sounding, don't just mood check. Check the details and eliminate the reason of the alarm. Avoid you reusing the disposable shrink. It's very important. And dispose the shrink after, after that. And always monitor the system. Check the volume remaining in the shrink and replace 70% or 80% full. Do not depend solely on the alarm system during the infusion. Patient may require conti continuous infusion and multiple drip simultaneously. Depends on the op operation operate by the clinical for each palm and tube. Another important is the power and the battery part of it. So battery always keep charging before and after. The reason is you easy to access, no need to charge uh, as, as wish, but make sure that you are prepared. Check the battery status regularly as pre-manufacturer recommendation. So if you see on the user manual, they will left some recommendation on the battery details and not Always install battery when the pump is used AC power. Do not short the battery across the terminal. Sometimes they intend to remove, so it can cause uh, damage. And if the battery damage disable and uh, of the leaking, replace immediately. So this, uh, this part of it, you have to be careful. The best, best thing is to do is to give it to the biomed engineer or technician to handle this part of it. Preventive maintenance, 
these are one of the important key things that you need to do to re reduce the risk of in injury and patient and staff and visitor and de decrease the equipment life cycle costs avoid operating difficulty is one of the important thing and comply the code and standard regulation okay when you talk about preventive maintenance uh, the important thing is quality tasks and physical infection visible tests and cleaning very important verify the electrical safety system make sure the electric uh, is safe to use all that and verify the performance of the device itself so the test tool and uh, cleaning material part of it when you uh, you always need electrical safety analyzer and multimeter when you do all this if you have an infusion analyzer then uh, it's easier uh, to do performance part of it if you don't have infusion analyzer you need digital pressure meter or pressure gauge and mounting glass glass type it can be 100 ml or 250 ml so when you talk about quality tasks physical inspection cleaning for both infusion and shrimp pump avoid moisture or contact with the water always keep dry and uh, clean clean the screen all that properly and keep the pump away from x-ray ultrasound and other electronic instrument clean all the accessories such as catrail and patient remote switch and store properly uh, most of the accessories like shrink catrail line tubing single use except the switching all that so this particular thing is a single use thing So when you talk about uh, other part of uh, physical inspection, you're going to check the chassis mount, uh, um, mounting of the physical uh, part of it, caster brakes, AC plugs. Sometimes you, you get infusion with the holder that can move around all that. So they, they got uh, wheels, small wheels and uh, caster and the brake and the IV pole so make sure that um, all in good condition AC plug line cord strain relief uh, both end then uh, circuit bre breaker fuse if you have anything uh, linked together but it normally these are part of uh, on the plug line all that and fuse check the fuse uh, using a right uh, value cables like inspect drop sensor and uh, airline detector all that and connect with the drop sensor and nurse call some infusion they got a nurse call line as well and con control switch verified everything the membrane switch of the infusion and the syringe pump you need to check the switch like start stop all that normally if you see on the this device shrink pump and uh, infusion uh, volumetric device the start stop button is like broken because that's where they regularly they're going to press more so you need to see the membrane of that particular switch and the indicator and display need to be clean sometimes what happens is the membrane is broken you get water going into the membrane line and 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 ended up the switch is not working properly and check the verify the alarm very important variable signal and labeling all that accessories and flow stop mechanism all that working properly or not electrical safety test is one of the important thing that you're going to check the 
against the electric shock thing, like uh, connecting the monitor only three wires and make sure there's a ground line, all that. If the power cord plug crack, replace all that. All these are physical check actually. And uh, make sure replace the fuse, same rating. Do not use a bigger rating or smaller rating. Follow accordingly and uh, only connect the equipment with uh, complying all this standard, all this. Electrical safety, most of this particular device can be class one or class two, depends on the manufacturer design. So when you talk about class one, the grounding should be below 0 0.3 and uh, chassis leakage current, it should be less than 300 micro M. So all these are very important details that you need to do. So when you see at the back of the device, class one and class two, you can see this particular symbol, either class one symbols or class two symbol. This is the checklist you use to do electrical safety. So you got main voltage, device current, earth ground wire resistance, and earth leakage current. You got all these particular measurement that need to be done by using electrical safety analyzer and enclosure leakage current. So these are according to IC6001 or 62353. So these are particular standard checklists used to do electrical safety. These are performance verification tests. Without using infusion analyzer, you can use a shrink and extension set. Always use a new set and gradually calibrate cylinder. Volumetric capacity is somewhere 225 to 100 ml. And distilled water, calibrated stopwatch. And important, do not plunge the tip of the tube into a water. It may flashy and results of measurement. You, it's very important that you don't put the tip on the water, all that. And you, when you talk about uh, with testing, um, you need to follow this particular diagram. These are shrink pump with the shrink and going to the cylinder. So the cylinder, when you set, for example, you program a shrink pump for five milliliter per hour and flow rate volume for instance of 20 ml according to the IC standard. And uh, you measure, carry out, it, the test should be carried out at rate of five milliliter per hour. So when you, when you run the shrink pump, this particular line going to send the fluid to the cylinder line and you're going to compare the reading basically. So if you see, you delivered the 20 to the system accordingly, that means it's good. And uh, you can see the checklist, what's the tolerance? Normally it should be somewhere five. So that's how it works actually. This is the diagram of the connection. And uh, you, once you do the, uh, do the setting, all that, you can start to infuse and you see gradually the cylinder, the, fu the fluid will travel to the cylinder. And uh, by using the stopwatch, you monitor uh, the delivering uh, time. So this is the calculation for the flow rate using the formula, flow rate uh, milliliter uh, hour, fin final graduate period volume and time of infusion. So you take your time and you take the volume and you divide, you get the flow rate, milliliter hour. 
and the tolerance should be plus minus five percent from the ready. So this is how you do it actually. So this is for the flow all that. So for occlusion pressure, you need a shrink set and three port valve connector and digital pressure meter somewhere zero to 1500 mm MMSG, And these are to measure the occlusion pressure level. So you fill up 50 ml shrink with 20 or 30 ml distilled water and connect to the pressure meter using extension set and switch the pressure meter and take the reading of maximum and minimum. Remember on the shrink, uh, shrink pump, there's a setting low, medium and high sometimes. Depends on the brand and the model. So when you set that particular uh, setting, you, you're going to get the range of uh, pressure somewhere uh, lower and medium value and high value. It depends on the brand as well, but these are the reading range will be somewhere 200 to 800 mmHg. This is where the reading range you're going to see. So when you stop, the uh, pump stop and the alarm, occlusion alarm is there and you will capture the reading actually with the digital pressure meter. And the connection should be something like this. So these are for infusion device. This is how you connect the line. So from the infusion or uh, fluid that going to the EUT or DUT is equipment under test or device under test, the term we use. So these are the shrink pump or infusion pump and you got three line tubing and going to the pressure, pressure meter. So when you get in occlusion alarm on the infusion or shrink pump, you're going to see a reading of pressure on the digital meter. Okay. So the other one is actual connection on the shrink pump itself. So this is how you do the connection. And uh, when the occlusion alarm appear, you're going to see a reading on your digital pressure meter. Some are using a force gauge to test occlusion as well. So when any alarm on the, on the string line or the pressure change on the string line is going to indicate on the string pump itself and going to create an alarm and you can see a reading on the force gauge. So they use the unit of KGF force uh, plunger. So it, when you apply a pressure on the plunger, it's going to show you a force KGF and you can do the conversion with the unit on the pressure, pressure side of it. The checklist uh, should look like this. So for flow, you can do five, 10 and 20. This is basic, uh, basic checklist for shrink pump. And these are the tolerance of five uh, percent plus minus, and you can do the occlusion alarm. You got MMAG and PSI, and the minimum pressure should be somewhere 51.7 MMAG or one PSI, that's the minimum. And uh, you can see low, medium and high that indicate the pressure line uh, setting. So these are normally you have to refer to the user manual on the user manual will mention about low, medium, and high setting on the string pump itself. KBO is keep the vein open. Normally, this particular part happen when the fluid is completely finished and going to give you an alarm of KBO. Okay, so this is what normally we use to test the string pump. And with the infusion analyzer, 
right here they they have a fluke analyzer and you can have quite a lot of brand in the market work the same method you're going to do flow and uh, and occlusion pressure all this and bubble all this so the step will be like do the connection all that and you apply the uh, tubing with the fluid you have to prime the line carefully once you prime there's a fluid on the tubing you're going to see the connection uh, see some uh, reading popping out this but the reading should be near to zero so once you prime already uh, the line you're going to see the fluid going at the back at the outlet of the infusion analyzer so once done priming you can start the setting and you see the flow rate on the on the infusion analyzer itself so you can do infusion uh, flow all this and you can see the connection look like this for infusion there's a connection to the infusion analyzer and going to the waste basically the outlet and for the shrink also the same connection so by using this setup of diagram you can do flow rate time occlusion pressure everything in in this partic particular device another second method of connection you can see with the iv pump and the sim cube uh, using a another type of analyzer so it is giving the flow line and it will monitor the same thing so you can monitor flow occlusion pressure and time the checklist still the same checklist the only thing is you no need to calculate the time because you can refer on the the analyzer itself it will indicate the time all that stop time everything so you just need to write down the details so the these are for shrink pump uh, checklist and this the other one is for the infusion pump checklist but the same method actually only thing the flows are bigger on the infusion on the volumetric pump so when volumetric can go up to 240 and accuracy about 10 percent and troubleshooting and corrective maintenance so this is internal view of the shrink pump let's go one by one on the details you can see a shrink pump internal with the power supply with the stepper motor connector all that and the mechanism itself and you can see the shrink driver the mechanism the driver rotates and uh, metal rod all that so that's a plunger line and the screw everything and you can see the actual device uh, with the string driver uh, photo so this is the string driver photo uh, this is how it look like with the plunger with the driving mechanism so the metal rod all that so when um, the uh, stepper motor start to move particular plunger can move and push the string to the end of the line and a string switch the the black one on the the small knob with the green all that you can see the uh, this that where the switch uh, react to the string string uh, itself when you put a string it's going to activate that particular string and will 
um, when you key the information, will tell you uh, what uh, what type of string you are using. Is it 60 ml all that? Because when you pull, that's a signal going to indicate the size of the string. So when the switch at the end of the rotor near to the string, it'll reset the motor mechanism. So these are how the string switch work. And you, you can see that's a broken part of it. The white, that's a clip, it's broken. These are very common thing that you're going to see uh, in the string switch part. It breaks because um, rough use all this. So common problem, you're going to see wrong string size, wrong string type, all this. And you're going to see occlusion issue, pressure plate, uh, dead battery, low battery, door open issue, then uh, airline, no flow, all this, safety clip broken, all this, and moto is not working properly or reverse or stall. So these are common problem that you're going to see. And I did, uh, we did attach a diagram on the infusion pump troubleshooting. So these are almost similar. These are string pump and infusion is almost similar method uh, of troubleshooting. <coughs> so when you start, you're going to check on the device can turn on or not. If you cannot turn on, you can uh, go to the down part of it. Uh, device running on the battery or not. So these are flow chart that you're going to use to troubleshoot and li make life easier. So it's a guide guideline for you guys. Then on the case study, Thanks, Gunnar. Um, so we'll pause here, just very briefly. Um, I want to see poll, so you should be able to see that now, either on your screen or in a green bar at the top of your mobile device. Um, about half of you have already voted. If we could just leave a few more seconds to see everybody's vote. Um, this will guide us on what is actually most relevant to you, so we'll just do a couple. Of yep, cases. I can see the poll. Yeah, good. Yep. Mm. Let me see if we can get one or two more people and then I'll cut it. Just about half. This will do. Um, so you should be able to see the results now. It looks like the most common error is the alarm error. So maybe we can start there and then move on to some of the other um, good yeah, as, yeah. You, as you'd like. Um, yeah, I can see the alarm error is quite quite a lot. So, um, so alarm error is one of the common thing that you're going to see on the string pump and infusion pump. Uh, depends on the setup itself. So, I. Uh, in this particular case study, we're going to talk about a few things like a damaged mechanical part, door, latch, string lock, battery failure, fire spark, charging issue, damaged pump casing, housing, alarm error, bit, and broken component, splinter, and other issue is def uh, software defect and inadequate user interface design or human factor. So this is what we're going to talk about. So when you talk about uh, damage pump, the first thing I'm going to talk about damage pump, these are normally what a biomet going to look into it. Very common issue. So the uh, main key reason is uh, the shrink or infusion pump itself been dropped so many times or heavily dropped, eventually 
uh, the end results, uh, you get uh, tracking on the on the casing, all this, and uh, the waterproofing um, is not working anymore properly. So you ended up you getting fl fluid going inside, all that, and uh, another thing when you drop. It can end up uh, your mechanism of the shrink pump itself or the in volumetric pump itself uh, going to break or damage or misalign. So these are common thing that you're going to see a damaged pump. So this, the second photo you can see a misalignment occur on the on the pump itself uh, on the shrink pump itself due to a drop. So what happened is uh, the internal part uh, broken and uh, it's misaligned. So that can stress the pump plunger and uh, stress the, the stepper motor itself and can cause unwanted, uh, unwanted uh, alarm, error alarm, all this. So that's one of it. That's due to the damage itself. Some Alarm are due to the setting itself. So it depends where, what type of scenario you're looking at. But this particular issue, uh, due to the alarm is due to the damaged pump. So solution for this is basically readjust back the misalignment uh, stream mechanism or replace the damaged part. And for the damage, Casing, you can replace the replace the seal of the casing, or you can replace the casing itself. But if you don't have um, other solution, you can use a bacteria uh, and waterproof silicon uh, uh, rubber that uh, you, you can cover that particular leakage area on and uh, replace replace the sealing with this particular silicon. So to, this will be, uh, basically stop from the leaking or the water going inside the particular board or inside the unit itself. That's for the damage pump. Issue with setting, this is where the alarm errors are always uh, you're going to see. The wrong shrink size, one of it, the wrong brand of the shrink or type that manufacturer recommended are not used, you're going to get alarm also. Uh, we have similar problem in Malaysia also. So a certain uh, shrink pump you need to use according to the recommendation. You, if you're going to use unknown brand because it's cheaper, uh, that's one of the reason they ended up buying uh, unknown uh, shrink, so ended up is going to give some alarm. So that's the alarm error code that will appear, and will show you the sh shrink itself not match with the particular shrink pump. And reusing the same shrink on the new patient, you have to stop doing that. That's the wrong thing to do. At the same time, this also can cause uh, alarm because uh, the particular string line maybe become soft and uh, or become very hard because uh, once you use a shrink you try to reuse it back uh, you, you try to dry it so the particular line become harder and you're going to get some occlusion issue all this and incorrect setting such as volume setting all this on the shrink can cause alarm as well so solution is basic, basic thing is you have to purchase according to the manufacturing recommendation and uh, train the clinical user to check the setting between the patient and never reuse the shrink again. Make sure the set, uh, train the user how to do a proper setting that can avoid uh, unwanted alarm errors. Another one is broken splinter. So this is another problem that you're going to see in uh, 
in the palm itself. So these are due to mishandle. You can see the broken piece of the Indian line, like and the white one. And uh, the driver driver nut is already moved, and driver spindle also moved. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are one of the things that you're going to see in the pump. So these are mishandled and dropped. And at the same time, if the mechanism is not maintained and lubricated properly, it can break this particular driving nut as well. So a lubricant the splinter line is quite important actually. When it become dry, it become rough on the on the movement. So when it become rough, you can can break the plastic mechanisms, all that. So this is very important. And the solution is to maintain according to the manufacturer recomm recommendation, typically every six months, and train the clinical user to handle carefully. This is, uh, I got another detail of broken splinter. The, you can see the difference between uh, picture number A, picture A and picture B. So you can see the driving splinter and undamaged piece between the driver. So these are good condition. The A photo, the B one can see broken piece between the driver and the driver splinter have moved. So these are the difference. So when this thing happen, if the driver splinter is broken, all that, uh, you're going to see a fluid movement uncontrolled or not going to move at all. It depends on the uh, condition of the brake. What time? What type of brake? Uh, thing happen. Some of it, the splinter still move, but it move freely. That's dangerous actually. Battery failure is one of the important thing that uh, people normally don't really practice of changing battery and ended up you get other issues because of the battery. So battery overheated uh, due to the uh, lead premature battery failure and casing melt because the battery eat up all that and battery can expand and crack, crack the particular casing cover of the infusion or shrink pump unit itself. And uh, when the patient try to move with the infusion pump to the, they're going to washroom anything, they're going to unplug or someone going to unplug and move, and they try to run on the battery, the battery is, is not working, it's going to fail. So that particular disaster is not good actually. So you have to be careful with that. Make sure, uh, check the battery every time when you do the PM, all that. You can see the expand battery. If you don't really change and leave the old battery there, it can expand because your Power supply try to charge the battery, ended up it create heat and the battery start to expand. So check the battery every six months and replace it. And minimum of lifespan of the battery about two years. So every six months when you check, the first year maybe you can still use, the following year you need to replace actually. And make sure the volume set loud enough on the on your infusion or shrink pump because sometimes you're going to intend to set low volume so you don't know the battery is low signal all that alarm you cannot hear the alarm so ended up you don't know what happened to the unit suddenly shut down all that so make sure that you always set the volume of the shrink or infusion loud enough to alert the clinical user Okay, that's all. All right, thank you, Guna. Um, so we're going to open the floor for discussion. At this point, I'm also going to launch our feedback poll. 
Um, so you can answer that one as well. Uh, please feel free to either use the raise hand button and we can call on you or you can put your question in the chat. There's the poll, so you can go ahead and start there. Yeah, we're very curious to hear about your experiences with infusion and syringe pumps. So um, if any of you have any thoughts to share, if you have any comments, um, any questions, please feel free to share. I'm going to be calling on some names here to get your feedback and your input. I see we have some participants from Tanzania. Evelius, we see you. The BMIT from Busoma. We have Dr. Maz as well on the call. Dr. Maz, we'd love to hear your comments. We'd also be very curious to hear how many of you even have infusion and syringe pumps in your hospitals available to work on. Um, depending on which country and which region you're in, they may or may not even be available. Guna, in your experience um, with infusion pumps, especially from the years of um, trainings that you've done in Africa, uh, what are some common issues that you've seen, even if it has been, say, two or three pumps that you've worked on, um, have there been any common issues that you can speak about? Most of the time that I um, see in Africa is like, um, battery issue, so they don't replace the battery. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, some issue with dropping. So this is the two common problem that I used to see actually. So some some unit the battery is expand, all that. So this this the common issue that I always see. Error. Because I don't see much user uh, inter using it, so I don't see any error complete so far. I, I remember uh, when I was in a certain East African country, um, they had infusion pumps that um, just used the tubing. Um, so th these were volumetric pumps, but they used a linear pers peristaltic mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, with the pins driving uh, the fluid through the line and they stopped using a few of those because they were getting um, they suspected inaccurate volume and so we tested it using a cylinder and sure enough they were getting inaccurate volume and turns out that the size of the tubing that the procurement team had ordered was different Wrong. 
um, um, was the wrong kind. And but um, but it managed to they managed to fix it. Uh, they managed to put it in the infusion pump, and they were even able to uh, begin the infusion. Um, and but uh, just because of constant use, the clinician suspected that it wasn't sending enough, you know, uh, um, enough of the medication to the patient. Uh, and so this is where clinical engineers, you know, the biomeds on this call, but the information you have now, if you have infusion pumps in your facilities, even if it's a simple graduated cylinder that Guna referenced, um, you can very quickly do a performance test, set volumes and use distilled water. Um, and you can see if, you know, I think Guna used the example 20 ml. Um, so you can deliver 20 ml into a graduated cylinder and make sure that the infusion pumps and the set uh, that they have at the facilities are in fact uh, proper. So. I know Dr. Maz is having uh, had some challenges um, with his um, with his microphone. Dr. Maz, would you like to try speaking again? Yeah, he's having some technical difficulties. Anybody else? Any more comments? Hello? Yes, Jonas, we can hear you. Shenjin, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I have one concern that I want to lay to you. One I, I want to bring to this desk. Uh, we as biomedical engineers, we are always busy doing uh, troubleshooting and repair. But sincerely, when it comes to uh, calibration or uh, kind of how how do we confirm the output of the equipment? none of a few of us conduct a performance test so i i, I would like to 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 bring this to asset international what are you doing to bring uh this advocacy to this um healthcare institution so that they can hear from uh be met when when it comes to uh testing to request since when you told them, I need um, an electrical safety analyzer, they will tell you, you have uh, you have the, the pliers, you have uh, the screwdrivers, that sort for uh, for the engineer. So after this kind of training, is there any program that you can develop so that uh, managers can have this kind of understanding? Thank you. Yeah, Jonas, that is a great, great point that you've brought up. Um, this is a challenge we've seen in so many countries um, where hospitals and health systems don't prioritize test equipment and toolkits sure. for biomedical engineers and technicians. Um, and so um, there are advocacy efforts happening um, uh, through the WHO, um, there's the IFMBE, the International Federation for Medical and Bioengineering, especially mm -hmm. through their clinical engineering, the CED division. They're doing a lot of work in this space as well. Mm -hmm. As far as we're concerned with our partners, the General Electric Foundation mm -hmm. and Ministries of Health, when mm -hmm. we do BMET programs, what we make sure to do is um, ensure that we're aiming for facility-based outcomes. And so what that means is we don't just train biomeds, we also make sure that we donate toolkits and test equipment because we want to show the impact the trained biomeds can have on a facility. That is our goal. Um, and that approach has worked really well for us 
Um, you know, I, I've mentioned the villiers and the demons out of Musoma in Tanzania as an example. I've been calling them out. We donated test equipment toolkits to them, and they've been maintaining the equipment. They've been calibrating it. They're able to generate reports and show that preventive maintenance is being done as per clinical engineering standards. Um, and when they start producing reports, the hospital administration, they're now very engaged. They're asking for this information uh, and they're valuing the BMET. In fact, at, at, at one of the hospitals, they even approved overtime pay for the BMET because they realized the hard work they're doing even after hours needs to be rewarded. Um, and so you're right, there needs to be a lot more happening in this space. The way we're doing it is in our actual programs, making sure that we don't just do training. We don't want to shortchange um, the, the process. We don't want to shortchange the solution. So when we do a program, we do a comprehensive program, including facility-based interventions. Um, and the ministry is well aware in countries like Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, um, Cambodia, the ministry is well aware of this type of an approach and the impact it can have. Um, if, if, you, if test equipment toolkits um, is an issue for you, um, if you could uh, drop us a note about the country you're working in, the hospital you're working in, you can email assisthtm at assistinternational.org. Um, we would love to capture your information and just add it to a list in case there is an opportunity for us to do something uh, in the region, we'll keep you in mind. But um, please go ahead and send that information to us. Um, Aaron, uh, we run a poll too, right? To confirm if test equipment toolkits, please talk about that, yeah. Yeah, of course. So I just shared the results. So everyone should be able to see those now. Um, and you'll notice that about 60% of people, um, probably including Jonas, did say that test equipment and toolkits are the main challenge that they face. Um, this is something we see over and over again. We want to make sure you feel validated. Um, this is not unique to you. This is sort of a worldwide global issue. Um, and it is, it's very difficult, but take heart that there are things we can do and things you can do um, to hopefully change that. One thing you could consider, um, so on, in today's session, Gunnar shared about how you can performance test your infusion pumps without an infusion pump analyzer. Um, the electrical safety piece will be hard for you to do, but at least you know you can do volume and rate testing using just a simple graduated cylinder. Um, sure. So maybe you want to do what you can do with the resources you have, and if there are issues with infusion pumps, you can highlight that to your administration to say, I simply did a graduated cylinder test and these infusion pumps are not doing what they are designed to do. And then you can highlight, if I had an electrical safety analyzer, I could also test for electrical safety because even, you know, even that may be out of range. So um, maybe yeah. that's one approach you can take too. Sounds great. Do you have uh, one minute? I have a, a very sad story that I, I want to share with you. Yeah. Uh, I, wa I went to support one hospital. The theater was almost down since they cannot use the anesthesia, the anesthesia machine. But simply because uh, the, the oxygen that they were using on the anesthesia machine was with lower purity. Imagine uh, a district hospital without even at least an oxygen analyzer. And you can imagine the, the, the mess that was created with uh, the, 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 the theater being down. Yeah. Guna, we've seen this, huh, in a lot of countries. Yeah, we we did see a lot. 
these type of things ended up with a low purity all this yeah. they say there's 100 percent oxygen coming in yeah but not at even, all yeah even even centralized system they, they will tell somewhere 95 96 but ended up you get only 50 or 60 percent sure wow. yeah it happens it happens that's the reason you have to do regular maintaining and daily check early morning to check the purity of the oxygen like a log book everyone what, what what do you have a price range for oxygen analyzers i know you were looking at some uh, recently i think for as low as 200 dollars to further up was it uh, so disposable one use um oxygen analyzers can run about 200 dollars um typically for reusable ones which are more ideal um, in most cases you can you can get them for about 400 sensors are usually about 100 USD. So it's one of the more affordable test equipment types, um, but that's still not a friendly price if, if your administration isn't fully behind you. Yeah, Jonas, so maybe that's a number you can use. If the hospital has about $500 to set aside, you could procure an oxygen analyzer, a very simple, easy to use oxygen analyzer um that can help you maintain um you know all oxygen therapy devices so uh, good well this is all on my end um aaron guna thank you so much and um, a special shout out also to dr maz i see he's having some technical challenges uh, but he's been very helpful in um in helping us with these sessions and um thank you all for joining again and i'm going to hand this off to aaron uh one last time thanks Benton. Uh, so in closing thank you again for joining us we really appreciate your participation and hearing from your different situations um, it really helps us to guide our future discussions uh, we do hope this has been valuable for you um, next week we will be revisiting ventilators dive in a little bit deeper on some case studies that are coming out of Ethiopia right now. We have some biomeds who are working with Ethiopian Airlines to actually manu um, not manufacture, but to perform preventive maintenance on all the ventilators coming in from all over the country, um, transported by Ethiopian Airlines. So we'll share a little bit about them and what they're doing, and we'll share a few of the problems they've run into and how they've resolved them. So you can look forward to that, and we'll see you at this time next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Joshua. See you, Aiden. Thank you so much, Jonas. Thank you, everybody.